Tonight's program is going to show you a little bit about spacecraft imaging systems. And our speaker is John Hoot. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's the president of Software Systems Consulting. He's been an active amateur astronomer for more than 35 years. Among his professional accomplishments are the design and development of the Mead CCD cameras and telescope pointing systems for the Magellan and Autostar EC telescopes. His interests include CCD imaging, spectroscopy, photometry, and radio astronomy. He's presently completing construction of the first elements of the Hoot Vega radio telescope at the Vega Bray Observatory in Benson, Arizona. So tonight, to tell us all about the evolution of spacecraft imaging systems, please help me welcome John Hoot. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I started uh, becoming very interested in spacecraft imaging um, as a child, really. Some of my early recollections of space was uh, when Sputnik was first launched and going out in the backyard with the folks and, and watching it go over. And then following uh, our space program and others as they have uh, brought back to us from outer space uh, pictures of great clarity and uh, providing us with some stunning insights into our solar system and our celestial neighbors. As uh, an engineer, I'm a professional problem solver and uh, working with JPL in this last year, I've gotten an opportunity to get uh, some behind the scenes background into some of the programs uh, that brought back the, these images and how they addressed with the technologies they had at hand uh, the problems that they faced in their historical and institutional context. And I found it fascinating both from the standpoint of looking at, at how bright people solved problems, but has also as how this technology has fed back into um, the amateur imaging community and the technology has affected uh, our lives and our, our views of the world. So I really want to talk to you about the different programs and the kinds of imaging. And it took me a while to get this handle on what's going, what went on historically. Uh, and it, it really worked out like this. If, it looks like uh, the medium uh, here is what distinguishes some different generations and different approaches to imaging. The film-based systems are very, started very early on. In fact, they go back to 1947. And the film systems, in fact, progress on through today with handheld cameras carried by astronauts aboard the space station and space shuttle and aboard the, the Russian Soyuz. There are what I call optical, I can't spell, but optomechanical scanning systems. And those also progress through to systems that are current today. The, the third line of evolution in spacecraft imaging systems um, is really, t you can see a break here. It started out, these are TV, all right? This is outer space TV brought to you. The original technology was based on Viticons, which were the TV sensors uh, of the 60s. And there is a transition that took place in the mid-80s from the Viticon tube-based sensors to solid-state imagers, the CCD cameras that some of you may actually have uh, uh, either in your instant photography kit or for your telescopes. The film-based systems were really um, a natural choice for high resolution. The first space-based imaging that I have been able to find record of uh, is uh, 1947 out of uh, White Sands, New Mexico. Um, our good Germans, <laughs> who used to be the bad Germans, it came over with the V2s and uh, they took the gun camera they used to put 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter uh, gun cameras in fighters so that uh, pilots could uh, document their missions and their, their strafing and so forth and do um, battle damage assessments. They took surplus gun cameras and they mounted them in the nose of V2s that they launched from White Sands in 1947. And those produced what I would call the first space-based imaging system, above the atmosphere, imaging both sky and as the, the missile tilted over uh, Earth. Uh, film um, has 
a number of uh, advantages. It's a very high resolution medium. It's well developed. Uh, it's fairly mechanically robust. And when we started uh, to fulfill Kennedy's mission statement of going to the moon, really uh, film was one of the ways that uh, highest resolution images could be obtained uh, readily. Also, overhead reconnaissance was another driving force in using film. And the corona satellites have recently been declassified, but they provide an excellent uh, example of how uh, mature technology, aerial reconnaissance from aircraft, was transitioned to space. It also characterizes uh, some of the challenges and difficulties uh, using film in space. The clearest and most obvious difficulty is you have to return the film to Earth. So you have to physically take the images and then return the medium to Earth in order to render those images of any use to yourself. And uh, the Corona spacecraft is a very interesting spacecraft. This spacecraft carried 32,000 feet of film. That's a lot of film. Um, it imaged, and this is a, a, this spacecraft was stabilized by spinning along its longitudinal axis. It spun at approximately 120 revolutions per minute. And each time it spun, all right, a camera, it had a pair of cameras that took two swipe images. The film moved in synchrony with the rotation of the spacecraft to take these swaths, which were about seven nautical miles by 119 nautical miles across. At the same time, a smaller cassette camera took an index, what they called an indexing frame, which put them in a context, about 150 nautical miles square context for the image. There is a space between these. Uh, they worked out the timing of the spacecraft such that these images were interleaved. That is, the next rotation, this element here is going to fill in there, and this element here is going to process to there. And so they are interleaving um, on their passes, and that's why there are two cameras. The film train, you can see that the same film passes from this cassette past both cameras. And so the film was indexed so that the, the images were interleaved on the film. This small cassette up here held the indexing film for the disk camera. Now, the problem is, of course, um, if you're doing aerial reconnaissance, if something happens of import that you want to get the information back on it right now, then you either, you have to deorbit the spacecraft, or at least the film canister. If you haven't used up your complete supply of film, you've wasted a, fairly ex a very expensive resource. And so what they did was they provided two separate reentry capsules so that if there was a, a time critical event that happened where you wanted to get the data right away, they would eject the front, they'd cut the film, reroute it to the other take up, and then they'd eject this canister with whatever film they had on it to date, and they would deorbit that and catch it in midair with a flying box car <laughs> and, and pull it in the back door of, of this uh, cargo aircraft and then bring it back and process it. And then when they'd expended the rest of their canister of 32,000 feet of film, they'd eject the second canister and bring it down. Um, so one of the things that they did that uh, benefits all of us who are amateur astronomers is in order to put 32,000 feet of uh, film in a canister, they needed a film that was, was unique. It had to have a very, uh, a very strong, flexible, low elasticity, low thermo thermal expansion coefficient base on the film, but it needed to have very, very high resolution and it needed to have extended red sensitivity because, as you know, the sky is blue and 
blue scatters more light, so you, although the wavelength is shorter, you get much more atmospheric distortion through the blue, so you want a film that's biased towards the red end of the spectrum in order to get the, the best resolution. This spacecraft um, at Nader, looking directly down, had a resolution of approximately six, six feet. It is about the smallest object that it could resolve. In fact, these, some of these images are declassified now and, and can be downloaded on the web, and it's kind of interesting uh, to do so. But um, the film that was developed was a film that we know as Kodak Techpan. Uh, what is it, 2215? Is that the number for Techpan? And this is a, a film that amateur photographers have, uh, astrophotographers have used with great success. Uh, and the first time I ever used it, I didn't realize that it was on this s stair base, this very thin, strong base. And so I had the habit of being in the dark room, and I'd use my fingernail and I'd you know tear the acetate on a regular film. And I went to do this stuff, and <laughs> nothing happened. And of course, the scissors were in the other room, and I'm up to my elbows in a in a light bag, in a dark bag. And <laughs> So that was my first experience with TechPan. I, I learned to put scissors in the bag after that. Uh, there's also a variant now that's available. It's 4415, which is on a, a more conventional film base. But uh, those of us who've, who've used TechPan and, and like it uh, owe its existence um, to this program, to the Corona program. Um, subsequent um, systems, um, surveillance systems, have used hybrid uh, film and solid state imagers. But I'm going to get back to that in a, in a moment after I tell you about uh, the other successful use of film-based imaging. And that, are the, that is the lunar orbiters. Here it is. It's 1964. All right, We're going to the moon. We've got no idea what's going on there. All right, So if you're going to land a human there, the first thing you have to do is survey the whole uh, body and determine uh, where suitable landing sites are, what kind of terrain are you dealing with, uh, what kind of geology uh, you have, will the surface support a spacecraft? Those, those were, were genuine questions in 1962, 63, 64. To address those questions, the project um, Lunar Orbiter was con conceived. And it was a film-based system. Now, how do you get film back from the moon? It's hard enough to get to the moon in the first place. Well, <clears throat> clever folks that they are, and this, in fact, has, has ties. I can't document them, but I'm sure they exist, um, to the, the reconnaissance community. What we have here are two cameras uh, aboard this spacecraft. You can see their lens there. Uh, there's a wide angle and a narrow angle. I think this is a 610 millimeter focal length, and this is an 80 millimeter focal length on these. Of course, there's no atmospheric distortion to work with. So we have a film cassette with our, with our friendly 70 millimeter film on, guess what? An S-star base. All right. It goes through a, a system here of uh, pulleys that, that take the slack out of it. And what is here is what they call a bimat. And you would not be surprised to know that a guy named Edwin Land, the guy who made the Polaroid Land camera, worked on this project and he also was associated with the Corona project and the KH-7 and some of the follow-on satellites. And if, what they did was this ha essentially is a, a piece of blotting paper impregnated with photographic developer. And so after the film is exposed, contact rollers press the, the exposed film against this mat, which is impregnated with photographic developer. The film is developed all the way out. There's no fixing step. All right? That's one of the processes that Kodak holds a bunch of patents on, to put enough developer to, to develop it all the way out, but still carry grace, grace gale in it. Now, you don't need, the reason that you fix film, the reason that you, you stop development and fix the film is because the film will yellow with age if you don't do that. This, if you don't wash the unexposed silver halides out of film, it will eventually fog, yellow, and haze. But we only care about this film in the vacuum of space for about 10 minutes because it goes right into an uh, electro-optical film scanner, which scans along the lines of the film, digitizes it as telemetry, and sends it back. Why go to all this trouble? All right. 
because we need very high resolution. In the context of 1965, standard television cameras typically had about 700 lines of resolution. Right. With film, you're talking about 1,200, 2,400, 3,600 lines per inch. Those kinds of resolution in a 70 millimeter film, which is roughly two and a half inches across, something like that, almost three inches across, means that they're looking at 10,000 pixels across the width of a frame. There was no way that they could get that kind of resolution with, with, with video sensors of the day. And that's why they chose to do that. And to this day, the finest atlas of lunar features is the Lunar Photographic Atlas that, that NASA published about 1970. Uh, I managed to pick up a copy um, at a used book dealer, and it's one of the prizes of my library. It is just wonderful photography. Now, what you're seeing here in, the, in these vertical lines is you're actually seeing uh, effects of the development and the mosaicing of the successive scans. The lunar orbiter was put in a polar orbit. Imaging spacecraft that image planets want to be put in polar orbits. The reason for that is a good photographer wants the sun at their back. They want the light behind them so that their subject is well illuminated. That's why these lights are in my face and the fellow with the camera in the back there is in the comfortable dark. All right. Similarly, when you're designing a spacecraft orbit, what you want to do is you want to pick a highly inclined orbit, one that goes around the poles, and you want the period of that orbit to precess around the planet at the same rate that the planet rotates with respect to the sun. That way, on, if you will, the ascending part of the orbit, what's called the ascending node of the orbit, all right, the sun is always perfectly behind you, your subject is perfectly illuminated, and at each successive pass, you pick the width of your imaging strip, if you can, such that they overlap just a little bit, and you essentially are wrapping the planet in a, or the, the body in a continuous ribbon of imagery. So when you see spacecraft in high inclination orbits, on Earth, those orbits tend to be 98 and 82, 81 degree orbits. Orbital, that's the angle the, the satellite makes as it crosses the equator. Those are imaging spacecraft. They are looking down. For whatever reason, that's the reason you put a spacecraft in that type of an orbit. And here is an example of the technology's foibles. All right. What you're seeing here is, a, is, I suspect, a fingerprint. When that bimat was prepared, remember that you want, a, since you're developing all the way out, you want as uniform as possible a distribution of that developer in that mat. Some technician put his oily, greasy finger on the bimat while it was being assembled. And when it came over that piece of the film, that's what you get. So that pretty much runs the gamut of film systems, except to say that in the, um, the late, six, late 60s through the 70s, uh, it is my belief, I've never worked in the reconnaissance community, but I've worked in the technology enough to sort of make good guesses that uh, this same technology didn't just happen in lunar orbiter and it didn't just get thrown on the shelf. Okay. Um, it was probably flying in, in early spacecraft. There was a transition period when, uh, f first of all, we were ejecting canisters and scanning film, and then scanning film and not ejecting canisters and running solid state imagers at the same time. So that, that our Earth uh, reconnaissance spacecraft have now transitioned to all solid state imagers, but there was a transitional period where they developed film on board, I imagine. The next class of spacecraft that we've got to look at are what I call optomechanical scanners. And they address a set of problems that are, <clears throat> are really um, uh, special in that what we want is very uniform flux measurement, or the measurement, very precise measurement of the amount of energy coming off of whatever we're imaging. And we want to do so very often at uh, several discrete wavelengths. 
Now, the problem with any wide field imager, any array of imagers, whether that's a Viticon, a piece of film, um, uh, a CCD, there are a variety of effects that cause the illumination of that wide field imager to be non-uniform. There's optical aberrations, there's chromatic aberrations in the lens system, uh, there's a differential response uh, of the elements. One picture element may not be quite as sensitive as the guy next to it. All right. Point sensors solve that problem very nicely. The problem is, of course, they only map one pixel at a time. So what you do is you use the geometry of the spacecraft orbit and a spinning mirror, typically, uh, in order to move all of the image or area you wish to image across a single point sensor. And it has the, the wonderful virtue of uniform response. Since we're using the same point sensor everywhere and the same chunk of the optics every time we do it, um, we get very uniform point-to-point -point response. Additionally, there has, until very recently, been very few effective technologies for imaging much outside of the visible wavelengths. We have for um, the typical Viticon uh, becomes very uh, insensitive at longer wavelengths than about 700 nanometers, which is just just barely towards the near-infrared. But a lot of the information that you want to get is in the infrared. Uh, and if you were looking at thermal signatures, weather, cloud temperatures, for example, uh, mineralogy, remote sensing, earth resources, where you definitely want to look into the IR. There were no wide field IR sensors that were very good. And so they tended to use these scanned image systems. Examples of missions that did that, GOES, the, uh, we're now in a next generation GOES satellite doesn't quite use the same technology. First generation, that's a geostationary orbital environmental satellite. It's that weather satellite picture that the guy with the nice hair stands in front of during the weather forecast. Okay. Uh, Landsat, that's the, the um, Earth Im resource imaging satellite. Uh, NOAA Tyros uh, is another class of um, weather satellite. It turns out that both the Pioneer spacecraft and the Viking landers um, use this technology as well. Here's an example of that optical system I was talking about. So what's happening is as the spacecraft moves across the face of the Earth, there's a mirror that spins to scan back and forth. So it's the orbital motion of the spacecraft, typically north to south, uh, that moves what I would call the vertical scan and then a rapidly spinning mirror like this, which goes across the direction of the satellite orbit that creates the cross scan. And then in the, this is I think from the uh, Landsat, it's brought through a set of relay optics and then to the sensor in question. They've gone a step further with this kind of technology. It's no longer optically mechanically scanned. It's now optoelectrically scanned. And what they've done here, um, this is the first generation of the first Landsat imager. And it used the little spinning mirror, and it had an array of point detectors, each with a discrete 16 different point detectors with 16 different filters in front of them. Some clever guy said, how about we just put a slit there, all right, and we spread the, the use a prism or a grism and do a complete spectrograph so that each time the mirror spins, we take a miniature spectrum. And they have a nearly continuous spectrum. They have 6,200 pixels across one dimension of their imager. And so they have a small slit. And as it travels over the face of, of the Earth, they're conducting a spectrum at each point along that slit to get a continuous spectrum of the entire planet continuously. It's an amazing instrument. The challenge is getting that data back. They actually have to throw some on the floor. It has such a tremendous bandwidth. Um, this is one that you're probably less familiar with of the weather satellites. This is a polar weather satellite. The geostationary weather satellites are great. They sit in the Clark Belt, 22,000 miles up. They orbit the Earth in exactly 24 hours since they're at the equator. From our perspective, they appear stationary. Hence, they can stare at the same part of the world all day long. Their deficiencies are, 
as they look up at higher and higher latitudes, the look becomes more oblique and you can resolve less and less and less. They also only look at one spot. Weather is a global phenomenon, okay? Uh, Hawaii's typhoon yesterday is my trouble tomorrow. So you need a more global view of weather and you need a pole to pole view. And so these are polar orbiting satellites and they're in those good old fashioned uh, sun synchronous orbits at high inclination and using this cross scan method in about four or five different bands and that data is stored on a tape recorder and then downlinked to stations uh, as it flies over as well as being transmitted down in real time when they fly over you. Here is the most interesting of the spacecraft images that we know that was taken without an imager. Huh? All right. The Pioneer spacecraft didn't have a camera aboard. There was no camera on that spacecraft. What it had was a photopolarimeter. They were looking for the Kerr effect. They were trying to determine the magnetic fields around planets by seeing how it affected the polarization of light. All right. Magnetism rotates polarization, strong magnetic fields. So they had a little detector with a cross polarizer on it that they could switch back and forth and look and see if there was any polariza polarization characteristic to the light and to do so at different wavelengths. Well, this spacecraft was spin stabilized. It spun around this axis right here. And the photopolarimeter is right down there. So, as they flew by the planet, spinning away happily so that they could keep their antenna, remember they spin it on the axis of the antenna because that has to point to Earth or we don't get any data. All right. So as it, as it drives by the planet, merely spinning this arm around on the outside, they just pointed it at the planet and eventually they got pictures. Our computer's great. <laughs> The last of the optical mechanical scanners I'm going to talk about uh, was aboard the Viking lander. Uh, the, the Viking landers they actually were, were paired spacecraft. There was both an orbiter and a lander. And uh, once safely in orbit around Mars, the lander was deployed. It made a soft landing on Mars. Now, since it didn't have a rover, didn't have any little cute stuff, it was, only, it was rooted. All right? There was no rush. All right, to get these pictures back. But uh, payload and propellant were expensive. And so they needed the smallest, cheapest, not cheapest, smallest, lightest uh, camera. And the amount of time it took to get an image, they weren't expecting a lot of wildlife. So they were expecting to take still life pictures here. Okay? <laughs> so it could take a very long time to get an exposure. And that's exactly what they did. What they have up here is a small prism or a small mirror. And what they have here is actually a little motor that spins this thing. And the optical path is the light comes in here and it's reflected down through these tiny optics and this little plate right here, this is a, a microscopic enlargement of it. And this is the detector right there. And this is, a, this is high density electronics circa 1970. This is a ceramic substrate, and these are individual integrated circuits that are then interconnected on this ceramic substrate to make the entire imager. So the way this imager did it, it scanned vertically. It used the little mirror to scan up and down, and after it did each up and down for each little filter, it rotated a step, did it again, did it again. Took a very long time to make an image with this on the order of about 15 minutes or so. But it was fully panoramic, and depending on how far down you tilted that mirror, it, it could look down at, at fairly low angles. It, it was limited as far as how high it could look, more than, than how low it could look. One of the interesting aspects, uh, when you look through the JPL archives, there are pictures that they used uh, in the Mars yard when they tested this. All the engineers that worked on it stood there to get a group photo. And of course, a couple of clowns stood on one side and waited to be scanned. And then after it had scanned them, it ran to the other side of the picture so that they could appear twice in the picture. So you'll see a number of the engineers that appear twice in the pictures because they, after they were scanned, they ran around to the other side. <laughs> Geeks. 
the first geostationary weather satellites, um, the GOES satellites, are, were also scanning satellites. This picture shows it better. Um, actually, this is a microwave sounder. These are the cameras right here. Again, this was a spin stable, it was actually a spun despun satellite. Huh? What happens is you have to spin some of the mass like a gyroscope to keep, keep it uh, pointed accurately. But you need the antennas pointed at the Earth or you can't talk to it. So there's a little motor that, depending on how you want to look at it, who's spinning whom, um, from the perspective of us looking up at Earth, this is stationary and this rotates. Okay? Uh, and this rotates at about four revolutions per second relative to this, which is stationary relative to us. And every time these little lenses, there's a little mirror in here that walks up and down the face of the Earth and it scans across the latitudes, as you, if you will, as it looks at Earth. And that's the way the first generation GOES imagers uh, provide you all your weather photographs using point sensors. One of the other nice features, again, clever engineers, clever designs, when this thing spins away, it's looking at the cold, dark vacuum of space, which is a wonderful calibration source for your sensors. You know what zero is, I'm looking at it. Then you spin back to Earth, and then you can make accurate temperature measurements. So they, they leverage off of the fact that it spends a lot of its time looking off into space to calibrate their instrumentation. And those are the kinds of weather pictures you're all familiar with that come from the weather satellites. Now we get to the television systems. Uh, it, it was an absolute natural uh, television uh, when we started doing this actively in the early 60s was a mature technology. It was an electronic technology. It would allow us to be able to retrieve images without having to re-enter media. Um, it has some significant technical challenges when being flown in space. One of them is spatial nonlinearity. Viticons are tubes, and on the front of the tube is a, a phosphor plate that when photons of light hit it, electrons free, are freed in the material. That detector is scanned using either electrostatic or magnetic deflection with an electron beam. And the current in the electron beam is measured. And it will vary in relation to, but not in proportion to, the number of photons that, that hit and freed electrons on that substrate. That scanning process is never quite perfectly rectangular. Because to generate an electron beam, you have to heat up a cathode, a tungsten cathode, they have a finite life. Those of you who remember replacing tubes in TVs and radios, well, when the TV tube burns out in your spacecraft, the party is over. They're fragile. You certainly don't want to launch a spacecraft with that thing heated up because that's when it's most fragile and you're going to shake it around at 10 or 11 Gs. They also have relatively low quantum efficiencies. The probability of an electron whacking into this material and freeing an electron is about 1 in 100. Okay? Only 1% of the photons you collect actually turn into data that you get back. Nonetheless, it was the best thing we had going, and it was used on Ranger, Surveyor, Viking, and Voyager missions. The first of them is Ranger. Ranger is a program that is a testimony to tenacity. All right? I believe there were nine Ranger attempts. The first five failed. Um, it's not quite that bad, but it's not much better. Um, they're actually, the first four Ranger spacecraft, I believe, did not have imagers aboard. They had other sensors. But this was the beginning of the space program. The challenge was get a spacecraft to the moon all right, and take pictures. By about 1964, we had managed to get a spacecraft to the moon, get a spacecraft that operated in space, got a spacecraft that took pictures in space. Unfortunately, not all on the same spacecraft, okay? <laughs> but they were getting the pieces down. Uh, Spaceflight is uh, a zero tolerance game. One strike and you are out. But uh, the program was restructured, and uh, I believe something in like 1964, and the, it was greatly simplified, and the focus was <clears throat> 
flying the spacecraft into the moon. Okay, hit the planet, win a prize. The, the idea was to put um, a variety of cameras aboard, and I guess I'll go back here and talk a little bit about them. All right, so here we have television, mature technology, point the spacecraft, drop it into the moon's gravity well, wait for it to fall in, get pictures. All right, the challenge here is, of course, the last picture is the best picture, because you're closest. But that last picture probably doesn't get back to you because the spacecraft is spread all over the moon. So you want, at the, at the same time, high resolution, which means lots of pixels, lots of transmission time back to Earth. But for those last couple of pictures, you want them back lickety-split. So the answer that they came up with here was a collection of cameras. All right, what we have here is our two high-resolution television imaging cameras. And what here we have are four relatively small angle, low-resolution cameras with very high-speed readouts. And so as they're closing in on the moon, what they did was they took the nice high-resolution good optic pictures, but as they, they came close to impact, they switched to these other secondary cameras that read out very fast. And I'm not sure I show it here, but I do have one picture on my disk. And the, this last one right here, this part of the picture is missing. That, that was, that was the, the part that didn't quite get home in time uh, when it went splat. There is another feature I wanted to point out to you because you've seen these a thousand times and you're probably immune to them. See all these? What the heck are those? All right. Those are, when you see those, you know someone's using a Viticon. What they've done is either on the Viticon itself or on the focal plane upon which the, the, uh, the imager is, is, is focused, a common focal plane between the imaging objects and the camera, they put a perfectly rectangular or square grid of points on the image. Because when they get it back, the scan is going to be nonlinearly distorted. When they have these index marks, they can then rewarp it back so that it's square again. So these are registration marks precisely to compensate for the fact that Viticons have nonlinear spatial response. The place where uh, JPL and NASA really went to school on television and on spacecraft is the Mariner program. Uh, Mariner program, I think, spans 10 missions. Not all of them successful, but during the course of the program, they managed to get from get images of Mercury, Venus, and Mars. And actually, two of the spacecraft that were originally named Mariner uh, took on a life of their own and became Voyager. The idea behind Mariner was a good one, uh, a practical one, but it had issues. And that was, you put a common spacecraft bus, and I don't mean a big yellow bus, a bus is the term for the part of the spacecraft that holds the housekeeping, the plumbing, the communications, the propulsion, the power system. All right, Those are common denominators no matter what you want your, your, um, your space probe to do. So the idea was we'll build a common bus and then we'll hang instruments on it specific to the job we have to do. That's a pretty good idea and in a lot of respects they do it. And this is in the day before you know, computer chips are dirt cheap. And so you know, today, you look at the thermal management system on a spacecraft, and they're elegant, and they have heat pipes and pumps. And, and uh, you know what they have here? They have louvers. They have gold foil louvers, and they have a bimetal strip. When it gets too hot, the bimetal strip opens the louvers. It cools off, the louvers close. Simple, but effective. Remember, we're dealing with cutting edge 1960s technology in these spacecraft, and the, what they do with it is, is really clever and interesting. The first of the cameras, it's basically analog TV. You know, pull up the rabbit ears and get a big dish, all right, and see what you get. But they transmitted essentially analog signals back. And what they got was from Mars, uh, the first images of Mars, um, and it showed that probably Percival Lowell was wrong. <laughs> Doesn't look very hospitable. No cities, no canals. All right. What they also found was that because of the contrasty nature of the planet, the noise of transmission, path loss, 
that they were going to have to get a whole lot smarter about getting that signal back and about conditioning the signal before they sent it. By the time we get to Mariner 7, this camera has grown up. Uh, these are actually two separate cameras, but clearly you see advanced optics. These are modified Moxitoff optics, IVAR rods for their focusers, insulation, thermal management systems, filter wheels. Uh, they have now put electro, uh, magnetic and electrostatic shielding around the cameras because there are so many energetic particles that were causing defects in the images. And more importantly, they have gone to um, a new form of uh, encoding. They've invented things called Viterbi coding and Reed Solomon coding. These are codes that, in fact, you use today in your cell phones. This is where this technology comes back to us. Uh, Reed Solomon coding allows the signal to drop out completely for a certain amount of time, and provided that you get the remainder of the message, there's enough redundancy in the code to reconstruct the part that you lost. This is real important when dealing with my cell phone, uh, and uh, also when you're trying to talk to a spacecraft under varying conditions. Uh, Viking Orbiter was also a Viticon. It was a stereographic camera. Um, the last of them was Voyager, and uh, it did just nothing but a stunning job. Uh, despite uh, being reprogrammed in flight. And the guy who was really instrumental in, in these programs, he's a principal investigator for the imaging systems, was a guy named Brad Smith um, out of um, University of Arizona. And uh, we have a long legacy of Smiths out of uh, University of Arizona, and we'll get to another one of uh, the Smiths' creations. But uh, they, they do wonderful work. <laughs> Um, this is the camera that flew aboard uh, Voyager. Again, you see it's Viticons, selenium sulfur targets, 800 lines square, 14 micron pixels, eight filter positions, 48 seconds to read out one image. One of the other things about Viticons is they have after images. In other words, a readout is not destructive. It doesn't take all the image off. So what they had to do is after they took each image is they had to bombard it with a massive amount of light to overload the Viticon and then read it down so, so as to wash out after images of the previous image before they could start the next exposure. Eight bits per pixel companded. By the mid-80s, solid-state imagers were mature enough and people had enough confidence in them and they had enough significant advantages that they've flown on all subsequent uh, area imaging missions. They're in our TV cameras today, they're in our pocket cameras, they're in our observatories. They're solid-state detectors, their geometry is very well controlled, their quantum efficiency is very high. A back-illuminated CCD will have better than 90% quantum efficiency. That means that 9 out of 10 photons turn into electrons that you get to read out. That can cut your exposure factor by 90 with respect to what a Viticon would have required. Their response is linear. One photon or 0.9 photons, one electron or whatever, one, you know. So, so that you don't have a nonlinear response like you had in the Viticon systems. They're much more rugged. Um, they still get zapped by energetic particles, but they've flown on all subsequent missions. That really is the only significant change. If you look at the camera that flies in Galileo today, orbiting Jupiter, from here forward, you look at that camera, you compare that camera to what flew on Voyager. They're using the same parts. All right? A good optical mechanical design lives on. The same camera flies almost unchanged in Cassini. So there was a great deal learned about spacecraft cameras. The fact that the detector changes from Viticon to CCD yields those advantages. But most of that technology is preserved. And you can see. Uh, the Cassini camera blow up, um, you can see many of the same structures in here that you see in, in the, and it's not surprising that the uh, University of Arizona had a lot to do with some of those. Now we get to the granddaddy of them all, all right? When you got the biggest, baddest telescope in the world, all right, you put the biggest, baddest camera you can put on it. And that is the wide field planetary camera that flies on the Hubble. And this is really a full-on optical bench. And I don't have time to go with all the light paths and reflections and filters and adjustments. But this is the 
whatever your choice is, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, this is the top of the line. This is the, this is the Duesenberg, the Lamborghini, whatever. Now for some of the odd men out. And there's two of these and then I'll take some questions. Uh, this is the uh, Mars Orbiter camera. This is what's flying on the Mars Global Surveyor right now. This is a hybrid. Um, this is a camera designed by a guy named uh, Michael Malin. And uh, Michael Malin started out life as a geologist, but he turned into a half-decent engineer. A laudable aspiration. Um, but what he did was, because he was interested in the geology of Mars and he wasn't happy with the pictures that he was getting, he designed his own camera. And what this is, is this is a line scanner. This has a linear detector, essentially the same thing as is in your fax machine. And what he does, the, the Mars Global Surveyor is in polar orbit around Mars, and he has a couple of different lenses he can put in front of his sensor, but he has a linear sensor that's oriented perpendicular to the, to the direction of spacecraft travel with respect to the surface of Mars. And as the flies over, he reads out that linear line scanner and he has resolution down here, I don't know what it is, it's talking, two kilometers per pixels at the limb, down to 1.4 meters per pixel at its highest resolution. This is a recon camera for Mars. They're finding amazing things. They're finding landslides, um, things that look, look like chiroplastic flows. Uh, and if you get a chance to get on the Mars glo um, Global Surveyor webpage, uh, look at some of the things that this camera has done. It's phenomenal. Now here's one that doesn't fit any of my molds, but it's really cute, and we all love the pictures. And all, there are more of them in, in the building. This is a binocular stereoscopic imager that flew on the, on the Mars Pathfinder. It's the IMP. I don't even remember what IMP stands for. Um, but what they've done is they've got you know, a little ET head on this thing. And what they do is they take the light in through these two apertures, put them off of 45 degree mirrors through relay lenses to a, a, what amounts to a roof, reflecting roof prism. And they put the two images side by side on the same single CCD detector. What that does for you is that locks the metrology of your images down. The interocular spacing all right, can't vary. We're using a single chip all right, so that the, the light path is symmetric and that the relationship between the spacing of the eyes and the spacing on the chips doesn't change with temperature or anything else. Right. And it's got a little motor here that rocks it up and down and of course it's got a pedestal here that spins it. And then the filter wheels, clever folks that they are, are tucked right in here and they're locked on the same shaft so it is physically impossible to get the wrong pair of filters in there. So it's all deadly simple, clever, and effective stuff. And that's what made those 3D pictures that you've seen uh, from, from the Mars Pathfinder. So that concludes uh, the prepared part of my talk, and I'd be glad to take any questions. The question is, why did, did we need um, Ranger um, when we had Lunar Orbiter in the works? And it's, it's not quite correct to say that they were concurrent programs. Uh, the, the Ranger program started a couple of years before uh, the Lunar Orbiter program. And more importantly, the Lunar Orbiter program pioneered a number of things. For example, navigation to get to the moon. Um, the uh, Atlas uh, Agena combination uh, getting ironed out to the point that it doesn't blow up, but actually uh, puts things uh, off into. See, they were putting the Rangers into Earth orbit, and then they were relighting the Agena, and then the challenge, of course, for Lunar Orbiter is to put the uh, spacecraft into a controlled orbit. We were having trouble hitting the moon, let alone putting things in orbit. So, so there were some dues paid in, in, in the Ranger program. All right, the question was whether these were motion pictures or still pictures, and it's something I, I didn't clarify. Uh, the television systems um, were what are called slow scan systems. They're not like the television systems that people use uh, you know, to take home movies. Uh, 
they take long exposures. Because it's dark out there far away from the sun and because there are lots of filters and other constraints, the exposure times can, can run up to 48 seconds or a minute or so. They want to collect a lot of photons, a lot of light. And then the camera is read out slowly because by reading it out slowly, you get more accurate signal to noise out of it. So these are, tend to be slow scan cameras. That's not always the case. For example, those cameras aboard the, um, the Ranger uh, were very high speed cameras because they didn't have any time after they smacked the planet to send anything back. Additionally, because the spacecraft is, is moving through the solar system at the same time it's taking these images, whether it's an Earth imager or otherwise, very often this, what's called the scan platform or uh, the optical equivalent of the scan platform, the focal plane, has to be moved to track the subject uh, so that the image isn't blurred. So there's a number of challenges uh, in, in doing that. Yes? Well, a question on this, on the terrorism and the like. What type of cameras or equipment are doing the aerial photography over Afghanistan? Uh, I don't have personal direct knowledge. I do know that uh, there's, frankly, commercially publicly available meter class resolution images. Uh, from a number of commercial ventures, including Spot Imaging, and, and the Russians also have a company selling meteor class imagery. The U.S., I believe, uh, for reasons based on, on my technical experience, is now flying um, imaging systems on spacecraft that have adaptive optics that look down. The mirrors, right, with a seven inch lens right, in a hundred kilometer orbit or 100 nautical mile orbit, you can resolve about two meters. All right? With a 14 inch lens, you can resolve about one meter. The problem is once you get these large um, mirrors, and if you look at the size of the fairings that are going up on the reconnaissance spacecraft, you have a pretty good idea how big their mirrors are. You realize that in order to get full resolution of the ground from a, from a mirror of that aperture, at near infrared and infrared wavelengths, they must be using adaptive optics. There's no reason to fly a mirror that big unless you're doing that. So I suspect that we have fairly, very high resolution images through the use of adaptive optics. You're from satellites, not from Right. Now, um, I, they're also flying unmanned, uh, we know Predator, um, and I think that's a General Atomics uh, product, uh, is flying. And that carries a line scan infrared surface imaging radar and a number of other payloads as well. All right, thank you very much.